Okay, so hi. As Paul was meant to say, I'm Matt Scales uh, on, the, on Google's Web Developer Relations team. And I'm here to talk to you about tools and libraries for building progressive web apps. Now, part of what makes progressive web apps possible now is a shift in the way that the platform itself is being developed. So on the old web, we got custom-designed, high-level features for achieving the things that W3C thought web developers wanted to do. So developers want images, so we'll give them an image tag. Developers want to lay things out in tables, so we'll have a table tag. Now, the new idea is this thing called the extensible web. And it says that rather than building simple APIs for specific things, we should be give, getting low-level, deep, powerful APIs that enable a much broader range of things. So rather than a tag for images, let's have a tag for arbitrary graphics. Rather than a tag for tables, let's have CSS properties that let, thing, let us uh, lay things out however we want. And this is great, and it allows us to upgrade our pages into apps, but there's this gap between the level the platform gives us and the level we'd like to work at. And we can fill that gap with libraries. Now, in the extensible web, the community is given the responsibility of providing simple, easy-to-use libraries to handle the specific things that developers actually want to do. And this is great, because it's much easier to iterate on the API of a library than it is to iterate the web platform itself. And this means that even as we speak, someone is out there solving hard problems so that you don't have to. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, libraries and tools for service workers. I'm going to talk about the new uh, web app features in Chrome DevTools. I'm also going to try and answer the question of, is the thing that I built actually a progressive web app? And is there anything else I need to do? So obviously, the most important new technology as far as progressive web apps are concerned is service workers. So just a quick recap. Service worker is a background thread for your application that opens up new features like offline, push messaging, and background data sync. And for the offline use case, uh, it acts as a network proxy right in the uh, client. So whenever your page requests a resource, uh, the service worker gets a chance to respond uh, to that request. It gets a chance to get in the way and do whatever it wants. And also, just to remind you, this isn't about working offline, necessarily. It's about, because uh, even being online can be a terrible experience. If you have Wi-Fi or if you just have a slow connection, maybe you're connecting to hotel Wi-Fi, or maybe you're somewhere where data costs a lot of money. What you really want is network independence. You want the experience of your app to be great, regardless of the network situation. But in order to achieve that, complex apps are going to require pretty complex service workers. There'll be a lot of code, and there's a lot of new APIs to learn. So we're going to help with that with a library that we built called Service Worker Toolbox, or SW Toolbox. And this was created by, by our team at Google uh, to abstract away the common patterns for connectivity independence. So here's a pretty simple uh, example of a service worker written with Service Worker Toolbox. You import the script from wherever, uh, wherever it, it's residing. Uh, and that gives you a global object called Toolbox that exposes the API. Uh, here we call toolbox.precache. Uh, and we pass in a list of resources. This says that when our service worker is installed, go ahead, fetch all these things, stick them in a cache so that we know that whenever our service worker is uh, running, it has access to these resources. And you use this for your app shell and perhaps any uh, really common small resources for, throughout your, your app. And then we use uh, toolbox.router to say to uh, match different behavior to different parts of our application. Uh, so here we're going to set a default. We're going to say that the default behavior for any route will be something called toolbox.fastest, which we'll get to in a moment. And here you can see just an example of a more specific route. Um, this is based on uh, Express.js routing uh, for anyone who's built a server in Node. Uh, toolbox.router.get, and then there's a, an, a URL pattern, slash API slash followed by anything. And then the behavior here will be toolbox.networkfirst. Uh, so let's 
talk about uh, toolbox.fastest, toolbox.network first. So these methods are what we call strategies. These are, uh, so typically you need to think pretty carefully about exactly what behavior you want, you want for different uh, parts of your application. Um, so you need to choose a different strategy for each route, or you know, potentially. An SW toolbox comes with five built-in strategies. Fastest, network first, cache first, cache only, and network only. So let's go over what they are. So with the fastest strategy, a request comes in, and we race the network and the cache. Whichever one is going to come back first is going to return to the page. So in this example, the cache is going to come back first, which is probably pretty obvious, uh, though obviously it will go to the, the network will win if it wasn't in the cache in the first place. Um, if and when the network ever does succeed, it updates the cache, so that the next time this happens, even if it goes to the cache, it's a slightly fresher version of the resource. So this is good for stuff that you want to be fast, but is allowed to be maybe a little bit out of date. Uh, and just as a note, because this one always uses the network, if your goal is to save your user's data plan, this is obviously not necessarily the best thing to do for all your resources. Network first, um, request comes in. First of all, we try the network, and we give that time to succeed or fail. And only if it fails do we then go to the cache um, and return that to the page. Now, if the network request does succeed, that updates the cache, even though we're not coming from the cache this time around. So that the next time we try it when we're offline or where the network times out, uh, we get a, a more up-to-date cached version. Uh, and so you can imagine, like, fastest and network first are good for slightly different things. So if you imagine a Twitter client, then when you first load your application, you, your, most, your highest priority is getting stuff on screen so the user has your application. Uh, so perhaps you use fastest to lo load the latest tweets, because it's better to show old tweets than to show no tweets. Whereas when the user does a pull to refresh, that's a pretty strong signal. They actually want the freshest data. So go to the network and only go from the cache if you can't use the network. And there's an important extra option to this one, because it turns out that on mobile devices, that network timeout can be two minutes. So if you have Li-Fi and your, network, your device is absolutely convinced it has a connection, but it doesn't really, then you can uh, have some sort of action. And it can be two minutes before you even decide to try the cache. So we have added an option for the network first uh, strategy that lets you say, uh, give a, a more reasonable timeout. So here we're saying, after five seconds, I don't care about what's on the network. I'd rather show something. Uh, cache first, um, go to the cache only if it's not there do we go to the network. Uh, sort of the opposite of network first. Um, again, the network will update the cache. But the, uh, one of the important things to realize here is that once that network request has succeeded once, it will be in the cache. And so the cache will be consulted every time. And it will never be updated. Um, so this is still pretty good for some cases. If you have versioned URLs, if you have some resource where the URL will change whenever the content changes, um, this will work fine for that. Um, <clears throat> and this might be for things that, are, uh, that you want to be able to cache, the things that don't change but aren't part of your application shell. So the example I've been using is uh, blog posts. You don't want to download 10 years worth of blog posts the very first time someone comes to your blog. But if they have been to your site and downloaded a few posts, it's reasonable to uh, keep them around. <coughs> cache only. So this is uh, go to the cache. And if, it doesn't, if it's not in the cache, fail. Uh, um, this is good for the stuff that you pre-cached, because you know it's there. And then network only. Go to the network, and if it fails, it fails. Uh, this is what you got without Service Worker. And the only real reason to use this is that if you've overridden the default with something like toolbox.fastest, this allows you to go back to the original behavior just for one route. And if those don't do everything you need to do, you can also define your own strategies. So here we have a, a, a function I've created called fall, fallback image. Sorry. What this does is it takes a request, 
and it will try and fetch that request from the network. And if it fails, it will respond from the cache. But it won't try and respond with that, uh, a, um, a cache of that specific request. It will always respond with this fallback.jpg. <clears throat> so you can use this, for example, if you have hundreds of profile images on a page somewhere. Perhaps it's not actually that important to have that in your offline experience. And you don't want to fill the user's uh, device uh, with those images. Um, so you have a single image that you use as a fallback instead. And to make this useful, you have to make sure you've pre-cached the fallback image, and then set up a route that actually uses it. Uh, so it's just the same as before, except instead of using toolbox.whatever, we've used fallback image. And finally, on toolbox, uh, you, you can get fine control of the cache as well. So by default, when you call pre-cache, or when you use uh, cache only, or fastest, or, or whatever, the cache that it uses is shared over everything in your whole application. It's a default cache that SW Toolbox creates for you. Um, and you can, on an ad hoc basis, say, for this route, I want to use a different cache for whatever reason. So here, we've passed in an option called cache, and we've set a name so that it will be a different named cache that it uses. And now we can set options on that cache so that this cache can only have up to 500 entries, and entries can only be in there for up to five days. Uh, and SW Toolbox will go in and uh, clean up periodically. Now, something we've kind of glossed over there with SW Toolbox is that that pre-caching step is actually trickier than it looks there. There are a few problems. Um, one is that in order to get a new install event, uh, you need to change the service worker script. Not something that service worker script imports, but the actual original service worker script. So you have to remember to actually update that every time you update, uh, every time you do a release that changes some of the resources, um, even if the service worker itself uh, the logic doesn't need to change. Another problem is that when, that, uh, when the install event happens, SW Toolbox will take all those resources and just download them all again, even if none of them have actually changed. <clears throat> and then you also have to uh, maintain a list of which resources need to be pre-cached. Uh, it would be quite easy to miss something out of that array and then find that in your next release, uh, your offline experience is slightly broken because a file didn't make it into there. So we created a tool to help with this called SW Precache. Now what this does is it takes a few simple options and it writes a service worker for you. It's something you can stick in your build step. You tell it which files you want to cache. It will take a hash of each file along with the file name, and write those directly into the service worker. So if any of your resources change, the hash will change, the service worker itself will change, and you'll get a new install. It also means that when that install event fires, it, the service worker has a list of every resource with its hash, so it can compare it to what it already has and only download things that have changed or are new. Now, this can be used as a command line tool, uh, installable via Node. Um, and then you call SW, uh, run the SW precache. And here's the, the simplest um, option setup. You say where the root of your application is, and it will just precache everything in that folder. You can also use it as a requirable Node module. So you require an SW precache. You call precache.write. You say which service worker file you want to write. And then you can pass in some options. So here we've said we're going to use uh, this glob pattern uh, to say which static files we actually want to cache. And if you're wondering whether that means that we've now lost the ability to do that dynamic uh, caching that S2 Toolbox gave us, there are actually two ways to bring it back. The first is with this runtime caching option. You pass in uh, an array of objects which uh, specify those routing uh, rules that you had in S3 Toolbox. So you have the URL pattern, and then you have which, uh, which strategy to use. Uh, and you can even pass in options. So we have the network timeout seconds option. Um, and this is great for most simple cases, uh, particularly if you're only using the built-in uh, strategies. And if you want to do something a bit more fancy, if you want a bit more control, you can just say that you want to import a service worker script that you've written yourself. 
So you could let S3 Precache handle all of the static resources for your app shell, and then do the dynamic caching using a service worker toolbox script that you wrote yourself. And it will inline that into your service worker. And this also allows you to add in things like uh, push notifications and background sync into S3 Precache's service worker as well. Now, service worker doesn't work everywhere, as Paul said, and, serve, and app cache does. So just to reiterate, should I use app cache in a new project? No, because it's terrible and doesn't do what you want. And the more you contort your application to try and fit app cache, the more you find that it's still not going to work, and you have to contort even more. And it has security problems, and it's, just, it's generally bad. Can't stress that enough. However. If you've already got an app cache for your application, we have a tool that will help you transition. So SW App Cache Behavior is this uh, little library we've created. And what it does is you, you import the library into a service worker script. This would be, could be your entire service worker script if you wanted. You create a fetch handler, and you just say in that fetch handler, I want to respond with whatever the legacy app cache behavior would be, uh, essentially. What this will do is it will get your app cache manifest, parse it, work out what the correct thing to do for an app cache would be, and then do that. But it also um, uh, allows you to get around some of the security issues and some of the things like um, never getting into a state where the app cache is never updated. Service Worker won't actually allow you to do that. Uh, now, SW app cache behavior is just one of uh, a set of things that we're, hoping, uh, that we're, that we're uh, releasing um, as part of our SW helpers repo. Uh, as an example of something else we're doing, there's uh, offline analytics. Uh, so this was written for last year's Google I.O. Uh, website and uh, was used again this year. And what this does is you set up a route for any analytics requests that uses that uh, the strategy function that's provided by the library. And whenever one of those analytics requests fails, it will stash it away somewhere, queue it up. And then when you, the user comes back online again, it will replay it and add a parameter so that it uh, correctly attributes the event to the, correct, the time it actually happened. And we're hoping to add many more things to this repo over the next coming months. So that was Service Worker. What other tools? Uh, what other things can we help with? So no talk about developer tools is going to be complete without talking about Chrome's developer tools. Um, and there are some uh, great new progressive web app features uh, coming uh, in the next release. So almost all of this is only available from Chrome 52, which is currently in beta. Um, but it's moving towards stable in a few weeks. So first up, the application panel has been renamed, uh, sorry, the resource panel has been renamed to application to better reflect that this is now uh, where you go to look at things to do with a web app. Um, this first panel is, uh, it allows you to debug your uh, manifest. Um, <clears throat> so it lists what the browser has, has detected as the name of the application, what icons to use, what theme color to use. Um, uh, what the start URL is, things like that. And also gives you this add to home screen uh, button that allows you to trigger the uh, on before install prompt um, so you can test code to do with um, delaying the install prompt. Um, service worker panel uh, has been redesigned uh, to hopefully be a lot clearer. Uh, it, the, all of the uh, service workers for the current application will be shown in a list, uh, which I should probably have got a screenshot of. Um, but it, uh, it will be less confusing about which one's active and what you can actually do to each of those service workers. It has all of the same features that it did before, but it has some extra ones too. So at the top here, there are these three checkboxes. Offline is a shortcut to the same thing in the network panel that says that you want the network condition to be offline. Uh, so that allow, is great for testing uh, the offline behavior of your application uh, and to make sure that your service worker is working correctly. <coughs> Update on reload means that whenever the, the uh, origin is refreshed, it will 
check for a new service worker and potentially do an install. If it's changed, do the whole service worker install dance, um, regardless of uh, how long it has been since uh, it last checked. And bypass for network says that the service worker should load, the install and activate events should happen, it should still be called for push and background sync, but the fetch event should never be fired. Um, Whenever any request comes in, it should not, tr it should not try the service worker to uh, resolve it. And this is good if you've got uh, your uh, save and refresh uh, workflow going on uh, for a resource that would be cached for a long time by service worker. It allows you to just uh, to go back to your normal workflow in development. The clear storage panel. Um, so. As a consumer of Chrome, you've probably seen the feature of clear private browsing data. It allows you to get rid of uh, cookies and things like that. Uh, for a period of time, you say, I want to get rid of cookie, uh, uh, private browsing data from a day ago, for, uh, the last week, or forever. Whereas this is a bit more developer-oriented. This is for the current origin only. I would like to clear these things. And the options that it gives you are things like service worker, um, cache, uh, index DB and things like that that a developer might be more interested in. And I also want to call out a feature that's actually been there a while, but pe uh, people don't necessarily know about, which is down here is this cache storage viewer uh, that lets you see what things are actually in the, uh, the cache API cache that you're using with your service worker. Uh, so this can help you debug issues with pre-caching or um, when a request is failing for something you think should be in the cache. So finally, we were, I was going to talk about the, the question of, is my thing actually a progressive web app? Now, I don't think we can really answer that question, because uh, it's a bit of an open question, but we can try and get a bit further there. Um, one of the things that would be cool here is if we had a button we could click that would just like tell me, is, is it a progressive web app? Am I there yet? Um, so the Chrome team built one, and we called it Lighthouse. This is both a Chrome extension and a node-based command line tool, uh, which has a whole bunch of different tests in it uh, to, uh, that it runs on your site and gives you advice on things that you might be missing. And it also has this very cool professional-looking logo. So as a Chrome extension, you load up your page, you click the button, um, and then it will uh, reload the page a few times, connect with the, uh, the remote debugging protocol, uh, gather a whole bunch of metrics, and then spit out this report. Uh, it'll give you a score, um, which, you, uh, which will give you a vague idea of what it thinks of your, uh, your application, uh, and it will uh, tell you anywhere that it thinks that you might have missed something. Um, and it also has this best practices section that is things that it's not going to score you on. Maybe you don't actually need to do these things, but if you do, you should check on them. It just gives you uh, a bit of a guide. Uh, you can also run it as a, a command line tool. Um, just for anyone who's thinking of typing in URLs they see on the screen, airhorner.com makes a noise. Uh, I gave this talk at I.O., and about 30 seconds after this slide came up, so it was like, ah, ah, from the audience. Um, so you run it uh, on the command line, and it will output, uh, by default, it'll output pretty printed uh, to the console. But you can also output JSON that you can uh, parse yourself, or the same HTML that the extension gives you. Uh, and it's also requirable as a node module. Uh, so you can say uh, Lighthouse and then the URL, and then that returns a promise, which resolves with the JSON that you would have got uh, from the command line tool. And obviously, the CLI and Node module uh, ways are both good ways of adding Lighthouse to your regular tests or continuous integration. I'd like to draw attention to the big alpha in the corner here. I just want to be clear that this is early stages. None of the rules are final. I'm sure there's a lot of discussion to be had about what the rules say and uh, whether they're good rules. If you would like to contribute to that discussion, or better yet, contribute pull requests, uh, you can find us on GitHub. Um, and I'd also like to point out that this currently only works in uh, Chrome 52 Plus, which is currently in beta. So to recap, progressive web applications are made possible by the extensible web. They're made practical by libraries and tools. 
There are a whole bunch of service worker libraries out there uh, from Google and from others, uh, with more coming. Chrome DevTools is awesome, as always. Um, and Lighthouse uh, attempts to tell you when you're done. Uh, it's probably a bit too definite in this slide. OK, um, thank you very much. I hope that was useful. Uh, <laughs>